I mentioned Social Security earlier in the program, and uh, oh, I forgot to self-identify. I self-identify as Richard R. J. Eskow. Um, we mentioned Social Security earlier in the program, and and how s- strongly it polls in swing states. Now, here to talk about that further with us is our good friend, good friend of the program, Nancy Altman. Nancy uh, is the uh, director of Social Security Works and uh, co-chair of the Strength and Social Security Coalition and administration. Her books include The Battle for Social Security, and she is co-author of the book Social Security Works. And Nancy, as always, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. So here's my uh, Social Security question of the week. It's been I've been seeing these things from AARP take a stand uh, and, and uh, you know, and it's about, you know, ask your politicians, uh, it's kind of an ad campaign, ask your politicians where they stand on Social Security and all of that. And I had a re- reaction to it, but when I have a reaction to something, something to do with Social Security, I like to check with you first. So have you seen them? What are your thoughts about them? I have a number of thoughts. First of all, the I think they, they somehow missed the boat here because... The Democratic Party has taken a stand. Hillary Clinton and the Democratic platform very clearly says we should expand Social Security, we should pay for those expansions and restore the program to long-range balance by making those at the top pay their fair share. There are about a dozen bills in Congress that give specifics to those general principles. So anyone who wants to know well, exactly how and how much, and there are, as they say, you can go to the Social Security Administration website, and it is all there for anyone to see that all these bills have been analyzed. The Republican Party, on the other hand, also has taken a stand, but in much more coded language. They say in their um, platform that all options should be on the table, but then they immediately say, uh, but no um, tax increases, which leaves only drastic benefit cuts. The real problem, though, so part of the problem with the Take a Stand campaign is that they're asking the wrong question. People have taken a stand. But the more fundamental question is they seem to be value neutral, saying, take a stand. We don't care what stand you take. Just take a stand. And they focus on the long-range balance of the program, which, of course, is a means to an end. I mean, you could repeal the entire program, and you would have solved the, the program would not be facing a a shortfall, but so what? The whole point of the program is to provide economic security and you would have weakened it. They develop a kind of, they play on the crisis mentality of those who are opposed to Social Security. Hurry up, hurry up, there's a crisis, we've got to go. When actually the real answer is, let's listen to the American people, we're about to have an election, let's have a vote on whether to expand or cut Social Security. I'm quite clear when I see the polling, which way it's going to come out, and then Congress can follow the will of the people. The issue isn't taking a stand. The issue is taking the wrong stand based on misinformation. Well, you know, uh, yeah, thank you for that answer. And the reason I say that is because uh, it's kind of a reality check for me. I mean, you basically, you you said you had two major points there, as as I understood it. Number one, you, you, you had two major points there, as I understood it. And um, and point number one was this, uh, that, in fact, Democrats have taken a stand, and certainly in the past, Republicans have taken a very different stand. Uh, but as I recall, 43 out of 44, or I think that's the right figure, of Democrats in the United States Senate voted to expand Social Security. Am I right about that? Democrats have taken both a stand on principles, and as I say, there are there's a um, and in the House about um, you know certainly a majority of the Democratic caucuses come out for expand. The platform reflects that, and they have put meat on the bones. There are, as I say, about a dozen proposals that show different ways you can expand it and different ways you can pay for it. And, so and, and there's Nancy, no question there's a stand. Yeah, and Nancy, I, we, we, we cut out for a second there. I, I, I had said I thought that something like 43 out of 44 uh, Democratic senators had voted to expand Social Security. Is that right? They voted for the concept. Right. It was, a, it was an amendment. It was a, exactly. It was an amendment put forward by, it was an interesting mixture. It was um, 
Um, Elizabeth Warren is obviously quite progressive, and Joe Manchin from West Virginia is quite conservative. So you had the whole Democratic caucus, and everyone but two Democratic senators voted uh, in favor. Every Republican senator voted against. And those two Democrats who did not vote in favor of it didn't vote against it either, right? Um, actually, two did vote against it. Oh, they did? Okay. Um, but they voted with the Republicans. But but yeah, it's still pretty good when you got 43 out of 45. And the two independents, of course, um, Bernie Sanders and... Um, and Angus King, King? Uh, Maine both voted yeah. for it. Yeah. So uh, it was really an, it was the Republicans with and I think the the Democrats who did it were ba- basing it on misinformation were but the but basically essentially virtually every Democrat has voted for it. So if you have a Democratic party that has sta- the vast majority of its uh, elected official Senate members anyway have voted to expand in house in house and house too. have voted to expand social security has a, a a platform of expanding social security you have a republican party that has moved to privatize social security who most of whose po- politicians say it needs to be cut that takes a uh, dr- takes a fear based attitude towards the, uh, that ad- stresses the need to reduce benefits and so on the first of all the very act of saying take a stand implies no stand has been taken when it has in fact been taken but the second your second point also i think to me about you know kind of posing the question in a crisis mentality you know what it it came brought to mind for me is the peterson foundation and its various shell organizations the anti-government right wing leaning peterson foundation that has been working for so many years to create hysteria over government deficits suggesting that they're an existential threat to our government and our society, it struck me that there was an element of fear-mongering in the AARP campaign, too, that as opposed to saying, here's a program that's fully funded for the next two decades and then mainly funded. Now, what kind of tweaks do we need to do to address that and expand it so that it better serves the public? That they, this whole, uh, it struck me that there was a kind of Peterson-like uh, fear-mongering about it. Um, am I being overly harsh? No, and and it's really kind of shocking. I mean, my first book was The Battle for Social Security. And the basic thesis is there's always there have always been a few um outside the mainstream, President Eisenhower called them a small splinter group, who opposed social security, thought it was socialism, the government shouldn't do it. Fine. They you stand up, take your votes and the American people disagreed with them. So they the tactic changed and what Mr. Peterson and opponents now say are oh it's a fantastic program but we can't afford it it won't be there for you if you're young you better watch out you know and and fear is exactly what they're doing based on misinformation and what's really shocking is the aarp which is supposed to be um representing seniors and seniors every poll shows that no matter republican democrat independent they overwhelmingly support social security and don't want to see it cut they're playing into that hurry hurry the sky is falling, we better cut it, um, by pushing for pretending the parties have not taken a stand and pushing for action when you have a Republican-controlled House is simply asking. It's a code for cutting, and that's not what the American people want. So it's it's very surprising that the um, AOP is pushing this light, and I, quite frankly, um, I think it's destructive. Well, uh, I, I, I agree with you, and, and again, it, it was very uh, reminiscent to me of one of the, cam- I think it's the Campaign to Fix the Debt, one of the Peterson organizations. Oh, one of them kept saying, you know, demand that politicians give you answers, and then they kind of show an elephant and a donkey as if the both, as if both parties were, you know, ducking the issue. Uh, it, it was very disturbing, and I won't ask you to speculate on why it is, but but I, I would certainly encourage people to take it with more than just a grain of salt. Um, and while well, and there, there's go ahead. And Richard, there's there's really another point too, and that is that although they think they are being constructive and trying to have P- Congress act on this very important issue, I think they're they are paralyzing action because. Of course, if members of Congress are being pushed to do something the American people don't want, 
they're not going to act or they're going to try to act behind closed doors. So the take a stand is, come on, you guys, hurry up and do something unpopular, which, of course, they don't want to do. You've got to do something. The program's, you know, going bust, that kind of stuff. But if the, what the Democrats are doing is they're doing exactly what the American people want. And if we could, if, if um, ARP, instead of pushing the, um, both sides sort of, you know, this false equivalence, take a stand, said to the Republicans, okay, the Democrats want to expand Social Security and make the wealthiest pay their fair share. Here are the details. Are you for it or against it? And if you're against it, what do you want to do? And flush them out. They basically, they're very cautious, as they said, and they're, although it was obvious reading their platform to anyone who's followed this issue that they are talking about cutting and privatizing Social Security, the words are all options should be on the table, which means nothing's on the table. So, the you know, that's not taking a stand. So, it's really, um, not only is it fear-mongering and destructive, it also is, um, it's inhibiting action rather than fostering action. Right, and I would just add one thought to that, Nancy Altman of Social Security Works, which is while the extreme right uh, Republicans control both houses of Congress and are advocating policies that I think would gut and have a history of trying to gut a program I want to defend, I don't really want them to take a stand. Um, I just assume not hear from Congress on that subject until it's run by more reasonable people. Maybe that's not fair of me, but that's... No, no, I think I agree completely. And the other piece of it is that if they suck, if they, you know, the, if the, the um, it's like Lucy and the football or something, if, if the Democrats allow themselves to be drawn into some behind-the-scenes thing where the benefits are cut, you know the Republicans are not going to say, that's what we wanted, the Democrats didn't want it, but they went along. They will say, look, the Democrats cut your program. And an issue that has been a winning issue for the Democrats, an issue that is extremely popular, will dissipate, and the Democrats will hurt themselves. Well, you know, I wrote about this in, I, I'm trying to remember now whether it was 2010 or 2011, one of the years when... President Obama offered to compromise on Social Security cuts and was pushing that because before the the announcement was made, I guess it was maybe when he announced that he was when it came out that he was going to put a Social Security cut in his budget. Before it, I wrote, I wonder how long it will take before the Democrats claim that the Republicans that are rather before the Republicans claim that the Democrats want to cut your Social Security. And it was 15 minutes, 15 minutes, <laughs> literally. And that was the follow up piece. It was 15 minutes that one of the more uh, junior members of the uh, Republican House hierarchy went before the cameras and said, President Obama and the Democrats want to cut your Social Security. So if they're going to get fooled by that again. It's pretty sad. So, uh, Nancy, we only have a couple minutes left, but um, we also have this whole issue of Social Security Administration cuts, which we both talked about, we both written about. But to me, it seems that, you know, Social Security's uh, administrative funds come out of the contributions itself. It's a self-funded program in that sense. But Republicans in Congress control its budget. They keep cutting it, meaning that service will, starts to decline and then to me, it seems that that's just another excuse for them to say, see, government doesn't work for you. Am I, it, am I being unfair? No, exactly right. There are two ways to dismantle Social Security. One is legislatively, and the Republicans are trying to do that, but on a bipartisan basis. To, but the other is to make it so that you've paid in all these years, you've earned your benefits, you go to collect, and every time you call the Every time you walk into a field office, there's a closed sign on the door or the lines going out the door. And one thing that's very important for your listeners to understand is that for most of the government, Congress appropriates money. For Social Security, they limit the money. Social Security has a $2.8 trillion surplus. It ran a $23 billion surplus in 2015 alone. So Congress is, you know, obviously... So the Commissioner of Social Security isn't permitted to spend $2.8 trillion in a year, you, you say, okay, this is a reasonable amount. But there's plenty of money there. But what, at a time when um, more and more people are, are um, reaching the age where they're eligible for benefits and seeking them, and I think the, the rules have gone up about 15%, they have 
they keep squeezing and squeezing, and they are limiting the money that Social Security's own money. They're saying you can't spend your own money um, on field offices, on making sure that when people call the hotline, they get answered. They don't have to stay on hold forever or get busy signals. This is, it is ridiculous that Congress limits, and that's it's called an LAE, they limit their administrative expenses. That law should be changed so that the Social Security Administration can start opening field offices and improving services. Yeah, and what worries me the most about that besides the 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 you know, not only that it reinforces their frame that government doesn't work when Social Security Administration is extremely cost efficient already, but but you know, people can't get the benefits they're entitled to if they can't get through on the phone and that of course may also be part of their grand strategy. So it bugs me. It really bugs me, and I, I'm glad you came on to explain it. And Nancy J. Altman of Social Security Works, uh, as always, pleasure to have you on the program. Thank you so much again.